She's the author of the book, Screens and Ego. She also has a little insight on some of the stuff that I went through when I was a teenager. So this is going to be a really unusual and fun conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jane Marie Allray. Thank you so much for having me. Excited I'm to do this. excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy about having this conversation with you because there's not a whole lot of people out there that I can talk to about this kind of stuff. So a lot of people really, truly don't get it but you've worked in this field and you truly get it. And people at this point have no idea what we're talking about. Um, So we will get to that in just a moment. So let's start off with a little bit about you, where you originally from, where'd you grow up? I'm originally from Michigan, the lower Michigan region. So Ann Arbor and Lansing in the Detroit area. And I uh, went to college at Emory where I studied Arabic literature, um, Arabic language and comparative literature. And then I uh, graduated during COVID and I started working at a facility for female wards of the state whose behavior is too extreme for foster care placement. Um, And um, I have a lot of observations about the way that psychology is um, teaching people to understand their own internal lives as compared to more traditional ways that people understood their lives like throughout history and across culture. Um, and that led me to write this book, Screens and the Ego. Very nice. I love it. You had to go through a lot of stuff to get to where you are now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. As, as we all do. (laughs) Can you kind of give us a high level brief overview of some of the stuff that you've personally had to get through? Yeah, absolutely. So in my uh, early childhood, I had cancer, which um, ironically was actually a relatively good time in terms of like the way that I interacted with my family and thought about like myself and my life. Because when you're a little kid with cancer, you don't understand death. So um, mm-hmm. it's it's actually quite a, <laughs> a relatively positive experience, although you do have to stay you know, in a sterile hospital room for long periods of time. Um, so Uh, I quarantined before the rest of us did. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And, and then um, the, the real moment of having like, uh, like, oh my goodness, like I'm a person in a world with a lot of other people um, who aren't always going to be nice to me happened when I started going to school. Um, And ever since then, I've just been trying to, you know, do the best that I can with what I have. Uh, I thought that I was going to get a PhD um, because I was very good at literature when I was doing it in school. Um, I, uh, I, oh, I, so my mom is of Arab heritage, but I never grew up speaking Arabic. So I was technically a non-native speaker when I started and I got really proficient really quickly in the language. And um, the, the way that you uh, like interact with a piece of literature is you try to connect your emotions to the book. And um, as you read literature that uh, diverges further and further away from your own experience, you have to like choose empathy across greater and greater gaps of you know common ground, right? So I found reading ancient literature, um, literature from the Middle East, literature from uh, the Caribbean. I also studied Caribbean literature in Spanish, um, and I, I got really good at it, and it um, helped me understand like kind of what uh, basic um basic ideas that are common to people across culture and throughout time are you know like what's what's relativistic and what's kind of common to us all um and i thought that i was going to get a phd but uh i wasn't um able to uh excel in that environment enough to you know do what i needed to do Uh, i had a good gre score but i didn't have the resume that really gets you into the best PhD program. And all in all, uh, there's a pretty serious problem right now with uh, um, intense you know, political angst in uh, colleges and universities that uh, kind of causes people to really be unhappy. And I didn't want to be in that environment. So I graduated having done all of this. And I was like, oh, well, I'm not going to get a PhD. What am I going to do? So. Uh, I started trying to find new jobs and, and that's one of the reasons that I decided to become a youth specialist and I've since quit that and um, moved to a job that's a little bit less emotionally taxing but I uh, that's that's kind of the story of um, how I ended up deciding to write a book. I imagine that would be incredibly hard on the heart doing what it was that you were doing. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's just a very difficult, like, it's a very difficult and, and complicated issue, right? So, so, um, like, with the beginning of the industrial revolution, people started to, like, have, like, a communal consciousness about the fact that they need to take care of kids who whose parents are not able to take care of them right yeah. and that um, came with the rise of orphanages like on mass as well as boarding schools um and uh the boarding schools and orphanages both started to see like a common behavioral profile right um so one if you take a group of children who have all been traumatized and you put them in the same room with each other now they're still people and they're still going to want to make friends with each other and you end up creating a culture of extreme um you know trauma you, you put all of the most traumatized people in the same building together um they're going to feed off of each other's traumas it's something that the teenage girls i was working with did all the time uh, they they would talk about what happened to them and then they would kind of have this like shared experience where they were all um, trying to process what you know each of them went through communally um, and it resulted in a culture of really really severe behavioral disorders um, and so uh, and by the way like it, even like wealthy kids who end up going to boarding school they don't behave the same way as kids who grow up with families right so so as the legal system started to uh, recognize the the problem of orphanages they started to implement the foster care system and i think that each state regulates their own um regulates their own like family policies but almost all states are unified under the principle that if something has happened to a child such that the parents can't take care of them you would first try to let a relative take care of the child and if that's not available you put the child in foster care um, which should resemble a family environment as closely as possible right mm -hmm. um but for some kids like it's not uncommon for for example if a, a female has been sexually abused for her to reenact her sexual abuse on other kids in the foster care mm -hmm. um home right and and if that happens, like now you have a really uh, difficult, serious situation where a 14 year old is, in, is abusing an 11 year old. So she needs to be removed from the facility, but she's not um, violent or something. You don't want to put her in jail uh, because she doesn't need, you know, jail. She needs help. So what do you do? Well, you have to put her in a facility with cameras. And that's uh, that's one of the main ways that kids end up getting diverted to programs or you know behavioral rehabilitation programs like the one that I worked at um I think that in the facility that I worked at um two girls had done something violent I, I didn't get to read all of their profiles but uh, I think that one of them had chased her aunt around with a knife and uh in an argument and then another one had a, a series of um uh, behavioral outbursts and fist fights and stuff that were dangerous for the foster care home. Um, mm -hmm. And then the rest of them were girls who uh, were behaving in ways that were sexually inappropriate and they needed to be taken out and given an environment with a little bit more support. And these behavioral diversion programs are kind of the last step because if you if you can't like, like the, the point of the home is to give you the extra support you need, but like it's still, based on therapeutic ideas like we want you to rehabilitate we want you to get better staff is um you know extensively trained in de-escalation techniques and then um if you if you still can't be in the program then you do end up going to juvenile detention um so it's it's just a complicated thing so back to you <laughs> so real quick i want to get your opinion on the australian take on all of this because this boggles my mind. A lot of people aren't aware of this here in the U.S., but in Australia, adoption is illegal. Have no, I had no that? idea. No, I haven't. Please tell me. <laughs> so I have a very good friend of mine. She and I were running a podcast together called Growth from Darkness. And one day we were talking about, you know, foster care system and, and um, orphanages and that kind of stuff. And she told me that in Australia, they outlawed orphan, they outlawed um adoption 
because they found that if they put the kids in these orphanages and then gave them the treatments and stuff that they needed, that they would grow up in an environment where they'd have people they could relate to. And it sounds, I don't know, like it could go either way. (laughs) Yeah, I had no idea about that. Um, That's definitely not the way that the American system works. But um, I... I do think that kids that have common experience in abuse can trauma bond. Like that's, that's definitely something that they can do. My concern is where they start taking on their own, like, like each other's trauma, you know? Right. Um, and, and that's, and that's something that um, can really psychologically damage a girl. Another thing that concerns me about uh, therapeutic environments is that sometimes you can reward people for being emotionally damaged in an attempt to like help them or like be accommodating or understand, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to be understanding to your behavior. It, the first thing that was said to me when I walked into the uh, facility on the first day, um, some girl was banging on her window and I said, hey, um, you know, please stop. And she said, Miss Jane Marie, jump off a bridge and die. And I was taken aback and I was like, um, uh, how do we express frustration? And she said, I'm frustrated. You won't jump off a bridge and die. And then, <laughs> right. <laughs> <No stinker. laughs> right. Right. This, this, I think she was 16 years old. Um, but I, you know, obviously like, it, obviously it's, it's difficult to be in that situation because like if, if a human, like an adult human was interacting with another adult human and said that, um, like it wouldn't be my job to talk her through her emotions, right? Like it's very unnatural to have a relationship where someone says to you, jump off a bridge and die. And then you're like trying to respond with kindness and empathy, right? Um, and when when you're in that relationship or when you're in a therapeutic environment, um, it, it is possible to feel, uh, it, to be a patient that's always treated the same way. So that you don't empathize with the people around you or you like you like I don't know disassociate from the general like fabric of the people who are trying to help you right and and that is something that concerns me about um you know facilities that uh, orphanages like the Australian method that I think would be less likely to happen when a kid is placed in a family because if you're a mom and you know a girl says that to you like you, you might have a little bit more leeway to be like, you know, I don't deserve to be spoken to that way. And, and you know, like if we're, if we're going to work this out, then you need to show me the same respect that I'm going to show you or something like that. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Foster care. There are so many different perspectives that people come through with, you know, my own perspective is going to be totally different from anybody else's, even if it's similar for me. Right before, right before I turned 17 years old, like within a few days before I turned 17 years old, I was put into a foster home. I had been in this very tumultuous, very abusive household growing up. And when I was put in this home, the, the parents, the mom and dad were both high school teachers and they had three daughters and they had a chore list and they made homemade lunches for everybody for school days. It was the most family thing I had ever seen in my family in my life they gave me a sense of what a family should be and I've carried that with me and looked for that the rest of my life only recently have I found it but I know this isn't the perspective that most kids in foster care get yeah let's talk a little bit about that foster care system and and how that works and what it needs and how we can make it better and all of that good stuff. Yeah. I mean, gosh, there's, there's so many things to talk about. So if you don't mind me asking, when do you think you got to a place where you felt like able to talk about your trauma? Uh, I know exactly when that was, it was a rock bottom for me. I, it was 2019. Um, I had just found out that the last person who had trafficked me made me famous on a pornography website. I had an adult son of my own. And all I could think was, what if he sees this? And it took a couple of months after that. But after that point, I finally said, you know what? People are already finding me online. 
they're looking me up because he's included all of my social media information. And if they're going to find me anyway, they might as well find out why. And I started talking and telling the truth and I dug deep and I got it all out of me. And it was amazing, but I held onto it for 40 years. So you were able to reclaim the story by giving your side of the story and providing context to what happened. Yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome. So while you were in foster care, you weren't in a position to really talk about what was happening, right? Right. Not really. There was no time to be able to do that. It was a very busy family. Um, I think that that would, I think that that's true for most kids in foster care. I think that a lot of kids, um, like in, in order to really like have the distance that you need to look at, you know, something terrible that happened to you objectively, you need to be an adult and in an adult state of mind looking back. Um, and that's hard for like me to think about, like, like I hate thinking about like bad experiences I had when I was like 13 years old. Um, and the degree of, you know, the severity of what I went through was nothing like the degree of severity that a lot of the kids in foster care have gone through, right? Um, and I, I think that uh, one of the best things that that family did, uh, and you can tell me if you agree or not, is um, giving you a predictable environment so that you, right? Yep. It was making lunches at the same time every day. It was dinner at the same time every day. It was knowing what was expected of us every single day and having a list of chores that we would do every day. It was it was so stable. <laughs> yep. Predictability is is really good for people who have been in an unpredictable environment um, or who, are, you know, so I think that Bessel van der Kolk talks about this in The Body Keeps the Score. There were like two different ways that elementary schools responded to 9-11 the, in New York, like ground zero. The first one was they would make the kids um, a bunker in the in the gym, you know, like with their, uh, with their heads down. Mm -hmm. And the second one was by asking the kids to run away as fast as they could. And the kids who ran away, um, displayed significantly less PTSD than the kids who bunkered down. Um, and the, the reason that Bessel van der Kolk talks about is that a kid who is able to run away has the, um, it feels the immediate agency of, you know, responding to the negative stressor in his life and doing something about it. And the kid who's completely stripped of any agency over, you know, her life, even if she's in this negative situation, like, like any, uh, you know what I'm saying, right? I got messed up there. Uh, a per- even if they're in a negative situation, if you're able to run away, then you're able to do something about it. If you just stay in the same place, um, then you don't have agency and you can't, uh, deal with the, the, you, you have to constantly be like, oh my goodness, like the environment might do something. It, it might, it might, you know, you're living in a state of fear because you are not confident in your ability to respond should a crisis occur. Wow. And, and I've got that book on my shelf. I have yet to get all the way through it. I have not met a whole lot of people who have, <laughs> it's, it's not an easy read, but no. it's, it's powerful. It is. It yeah. is powerful. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a good book. It's a good book for people who have experienced serious trauma. Um, I would say that, you know, uh, like rehabilitating someone who genuinely has gone through really serious trauma and um, uh, like some or someone who has like severe bipolar disorder, it's really hard. It's yeah. really hard to treat someone with a genuine bipolar disorder. Maybe that person is an adult that's not functional enough to hold down a job. So the therapist can't like, you know, dedicate an hour or a week to this person because they're too uh, unreliable to actually go through a course of treatment, you know, Um, severe bipolar disorder, things like that is a separate class of psychology than like general psychology um, that you kind of like see in schools nowadays. Um, and, and I do think that there's, there's a big difference between um, helping someone in the way that Bessel van der Kolk is helping them and just kind of like generally talking about like, like, um, like uh, minor traumas, because I think that therapy, if it's applied incorrectly, does have the ability to 
hurt someone right like like if you have a bad therapist like it can really like I I had a bad therapist once right yeah and like basically she would agree with all of my like negative thoughts and rumination and she'd be like oh my goodness that person does sound toxic uh and it exploded all of the little things that like otherwise could have gotten over right so so you can have bad therapy right and and if a child who's actually traumatized is getting bad therapy then it's like really 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 bad um but the the reason that i say that is that um uh bessel van der kolk uh, it has a really powerful series of ideas if they're they are applied to the right person at the right time. I actually start out my own autobiography talking about uh, sitting in a session with a therapist whose main reaction to anything I would say was a downward pitched hum. Hmm. Oh, well, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Not helpful. <laughs> helpful. <laughs> so. Um, I know we've talked about the body keeps the score quite a bit, but let's talk a bit more about your book. I understand you have a part that you would like to read for us. Yes, absolutely. So um, the the main philosophical contribution that my book gives is it um, talks about, it, it's a series of fictional stories, right? So it's going to talk about like Middle East, it's going to talk about Uzbekistan, it's going to talk about um, my own experiences and the experiences of the people around me um, who had doctors who exacerbated their mental health issues. Um, and it's ultimately going to compare and contrast therapeutic um, understanding of the self with a uh, more traditional religious understanding of the self, right? Mm -hmm. So in, um, uh, so before Freud, uh, people would say things like, uh, don't uh, don't think about the past because the past cannot be changed, right? And in psychotherapy, the main thing that you do is go over the past, right? So um, the term mental emotional health is referring to your internal life and the word soul used to also refer to your internal life, but soul is operating in a religious context. And the idea of a soul is that if you behave correctly, then your soul can be right with God. And um, mental health or emotional health is operating within a medicalized context and the idea is that if your um, mental health isn't um, perfectly aligned then there's a medical disorder going on right, right. Um, and and I think that um, and, and I think that for a lot of people uh, the the framing the vocabulary that we have to talk about our own internal lives really changes the way that we go about trying to solve and, and get that inner peace that everyone is looking for that like acceptance of reality that being okay with you know my past mistakes um being able to deal with guilt and shame and then also being able to genuinely respect myself um so uh i will read what is the difference between depression and religious words like guilt shame grief and sorrow the difference is their implied cause. The implied cause of guilt is that my grandma has somehow disrupted her relationship with God and she needs to make it right. The implied cause of shame is that she has somehow disrupted her relationship with her community. The implied cause of grief is that something unjust affected her. The implied cause of sorrow is more existential, so it is more like depression than any of the other words in her arsenal. But the direction of sorrow is very much pointed up. When she's talking about sorrow, she's talking to God. The words my grandma uses prescribe the cause and set her on a path towards solution. If my grandma feels guilt, she apologizes and it goes away. If my grandma feels shame, she makes peace and it goes away. But many internet people who suffer from de depression float in their egos, asking, why is this happening? Why am I so unhappy? Utterly sideswiped as to what might have gotten them there. I feel that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you know, it's kind of like the, the main question of the age, like, why are so many people so unhappy? You know, like, why? What's what's going on? So the book talks about that. And, ah. and I and uh, thanks. And a lot of the people who have read it, 
teenage females and um, New York Times bestselling authors alike have said that this book actually did really help them uh, root themselves in reality is what uh, Thomas C. Foster said. So, Oh, wonderful. Is there something in there about the power of human connection? Us needing each other? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, a ton. A yes, because that's something I'm very big on and very much believe in myself is we can't do this alone. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Well, it has come to that point in the episode where I have to ask you my last question, which is sad because I have really enjoyed this conversation. That's not something you'll hear me say on most of my episodes. Um, mm -hmm. I enjoyed my conversations, but this one was extra special. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. Thank you so much. So my last question for you. So what is one thing that you truly love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? That's a great question. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a great question. Um, I would say that I um, respect my ability to, uh, I respect my ability to be conscious of my own actions. Um, and it took a while to get there, you know, like, I, I don't think that I was really conscious of, you know, when I was a teenager, maybe, um, and I was speaking, I was thinking about my perspective and not the perspective of the person to whom I was speaking. And I think that that's like the vast majority of teenagers. Um, but as an adult, I think that I developed a pretty keen awareness of um, the, the way that I act in the world. Uh, and I think that, um, my reflections have helped a lot of people feel a great sense of peace despite the negative situations in their life despite the you know previous experiences they had um overcoming uh things like when someone was mean to you and and also overcoming experiences where you were mean to other people and you're consumed by by like the shame of of what you've done that you wish you hadn't done um I think that being able to uh, help people feel okay with being at peace with their past um, is probably the best way to help someone genuinely respect themselves. And that's what I, I respect about myself. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself.